Hello everyone, I'm Daz and welcome to American Civil War and UK History Podcast. This presentation is available as a video on our YouTube channel and as a podcast from wherever you get your podcast from. And remember on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and TikTok. And joining me today is a good friend of mine and historian, the unfilled historian himself, Tyler McGraw. Welcome, Tyler. Well, Darren, thank you so much for having me. I'm uh, beyond excited because this has been a, a long time coming for the both of us to sit down and finally talk about this. So uh, to be able to have this on your channel is, is beyond exciting. So thanks for having me, man. Yeah. And again, so again, today's discussion is about the Titanic. And again, this has been about a year in the making. Uh, we've been meaning to sit down to uh, do this podcast for some time, but we're finally here. So while we're on the subject, Mm -hmm. let's talk about why you got interested because firstly to titanic is integral part of you and your story as a historian yeah. so tell us how you got into history and why the titanic drew your attention sure so um i'm going to start out by actually dating myself and basically telling you guys how old i am without even you know going into that but uh 1995 i'm born 1997 the big movie comes out by james cameron right so um, in 97, I guess I'm getting my formulative ideas, my head starting to spin a little bit, and I'm really starting to understand Titanic, I guess, because the movie, it's everywhere. Entertainment Tonight, TV channels, um, my parents are watching TV. Of course, there's a, uh, a, a blurb about the Titanic on there. And that's how it actually starts. And it's kind of comical, too, because... Um, <laughs> Young Tyler misinterpreted what the uh, host on Entertainment Tonight said. She was talking about the Titanic sinking and they, they showed a visual image of the ship and all the rusticles, or uh, we'll talk about what they are later, but uh, the, the rusticles, we'll call them, um, and, and was talking about how it sunk. And I misheard her and I thought she said that it stunk. And I'm looking at this green ship. I'm like, well, of course it stunk. It's green and nasty and it's like looks like poop. I mean, I don't know what else to say, um, but that was it. That's what really started that. Because my mom told me, no, it sank. Of course, I had no idea what that means that young of an age. So I, I'm kind of just like, well, well, what does that mean? I thought it was just a stinky ship. Um, I see the movie at a very young age, uh, just right around 98, 99. And that movie floored me. Um, I saw a lot of things in that movie that a, a young Tyler probably shouldn't have seen. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you all know exactly what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. Uh, but the sinking, um, to, to get a little serious here that was where it really started to see that level of destruction and sadness in families torn apart by something natural by a, a ship foundering to the bottom of the ocean um, really struck me hard as a, as a young kid. And I, I don't know. I just, I really gripped that aspect of the Titanic. And from there, I've had things like uh, the, the, the picture you have here in the background, actually, as a very young boy, I had that as a kid as a shirt. I, I was, it was accessible. This is still a new thing. This is one of the largest uh, motion pictures to come out of the 90s, if not the largest motion picture to come out of the 90s, not taking away from Saving Private Ryan or anything. But it, it was just so accessible. And I think because of how accessible it was, I was able to latch onto something. And, you know, like you just said, it's so integral to my, my obsession and my love and passion of history because this is where it all starts. If it wasn't for this movie, if it wasn't for this ship, I don't think I would be here with the enthusiasm and love of history I had today. So it really came from um, James Cameron's 97 movie uh, and, and just being able to see that at such a young age and all the exposure I was um, having access to at that age. Yeah. And again, you know, I remember the movie like it was yesterday. You know, um, I was a little bit older than you, um, but I do remember it when it came out. And I remember watching it and having those same sort of feelings of, you know, again, you've got that love story element in it. But of course, you've got that tragedy as well. And you do. It, it, yeah. Some of those scenes are very upsetting. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, very much so. Um, so cool. And of course, there has been other movies made. So in 1958, there was a movie called A Night to Remember. I don't know if you've there ever was. seen that. Oh my gosh, I, I love that actually. Uh, it's a black and white film. And believe it or not, if you go on YouTube and look up The Night to Remember, you may notice that it has been colorized. Um, it awesome. is the the very first film. There's actually one, I don't know if you're going to get into it or not, but I'll go ahead and drop it. Uh, in the 1930s and early 40s, the Nazis made a film called The Nazi Titanic, uh, a weird Third Reich propaganda film. Wow. Um, the Germans were the officers on the Titanic, not the British, because, you know, the Germans could do no wrong. Not that they had wow. this huge yeah, Third Reich going on, but 
there, there is a, a Nazi Titanic film even, which is horrible in it's painting the Germans as these angelic creators and the British are the real masterminds behind sinking the Titanic in this. Uh, again, very much a propaganda film, but it, it's always been something of a pop culture idea to bring the Titanic to the screen, bring it to the book. Um, are you going to talk about the Titan at all? Do you have plans to bring the Titan up? Uh, a book by a gentleman by the last name of Morgan, since we're on the pop Can't culture topic. Yeah. Okay. So in the 1880s, I believe, there is a book that comes out called The Wreck of the Titan, which forecasts the Titanic's exact destiny, which is so crazy to think about. So uh, when this book comes out, it's about a huge ocean liner that is uh, brand new on its maiden voyage that sinks on its maiden voyage. Uh, it's the largest of the time. Many people go down. There's a lot of less fortunate than others. So we have a class system in the book. And this is out years before the Titanic's even actually thought of. So even like I like to tell people, even before the ship was created, this thing has been in pop culture since the 1880s. Uh, it's a really crazy thing to even consider, but you know that that's fact. That's not one of the tinfoil conspiracies we might get into a little later. Wow. Okay, cool. Yeah, I didn't know about that. Yeah. Um, okay, let's talk about the story of the Titanic because it starts sure. with one man and that is uh, a guy called Thomas Andrews. So Tyler, tell us about Thomas Andrews and how he ends up becoming involved with the building and with the Titanic in general. Sure thing. So um, Thomas Andrews is, at the time, a very integral part of this story. But before we get into Thomas Andrews, there's actually quite a few people that help bring this to fruition to give Thomas Andrews the ability to make the Titanic happen. Um, we will give Thomas Andrews pretty much the credit of formulating the Titanic into existence. But there's some people before him that really are the, the, the brainchild of this. Um, I want to start with the first gentleman who is the kind of the head of what we call the White Star Line. Now, at the turn of the century in the 1900s, there is this organization known as Cunard Line. They are a uh, English-based shipbuilding company that has produced some of the most luxurious ships to grace the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, the Cunard had two large ships known as the Mauritania and the Lusitania, and they were magnificent for its time, and incredibly much so. And their rival company, the White Star Line, wanted to outdo them. The Lusitania and the Mauritania were the fastest passenger ships at that time. Uh, there were some German lines too, um, Hamburg, America, and I uh, hope I'm pronouncing this right and not uh, butchering it, but Norddeutscher Lloyd. And uh, they, they weren't as big, but uh, there, was, there was this idea to compete. So the White Star Line wants to do that. And championing the White Star Line is a man by the name of Lord Pirie. Uh, he's an Irish guy out of um, Belfast, Ireland. Of course, he's in uh, charge of the White Star Line. His idea was to create not the fastest ship afloat, but the most luxurious ship afloat to, to compete against these two major ocean liners who are currently the fastest and luxurious, but to make it larger. And he's not only going to start with one. In fact, Titanic has two sister ships that we'll talk about. Um, they're known as Olympic class liners. So this is the idea that comes out of Pierre's head. Thomas Andrews is directly in charge of this. He's actually the chief naval architect of the Harland and Wolf shipyard where the Titanic would be constructed. So when uh, Lord Pierre decides that he is going to organize this, he's got some help. The White Star Line chairman, J. Bruce Ismay works with the American financier J.P. Morgan, who many of you know, who is the um, kind of the parent company of the White Star Line known as the International Mercantile Marine Company. The idea is to build three, three Olympic class liners. The Olympic will be the first ship number 400. And then the second, which we're gonna talk about is 401, the RMS Titanic. When Ismay and Morgan and Pierre sit down to organize this whole thing, <clears throat> they try to figure out naming. The name Titanic is from the Greek Titans. Obviously, um, Titans were large, godlike creature creatures, I, I should say, uh, uh, figures. And of course, they wanted to have these names apply to a ship that was going to be a godlike ship, if you will. The ship isn't going to be some small 
fast vessel to get you over to the Atlantic, to the New York City, or back to England. This is going to be a floating palace. So, of course, Titanic is an appropriate name for it. Um, and again, in charge of all of this is Mr. Thomas Andrews, who is in charge of the Harland and Wolf shipyards, which is actually in Belfast, Ireland. Despite the Titanic having the register of Liverpool on its stern, it is actually built in Ireland, um, but it is a registered English ship. Port of registry is Liverpool, England there. So uh, Thomas Andrews is given credit a lot in history to being the the like owner or, or the, the mastermind behind this thing, but really he's just the the shipyard uh, overseer. He, he's the one that's the chief naval architect. So he's the architect of the ship. This is his design, his build, under the tutelage of the White Star Line. Cool. And again, just give us an idea of the size of these ships, you know, of the Earth. Sure. In particular, the Titanic. And of course, so I've got a picture here um, mm -hmm. of the Olympic and the Titanic side by side. But just give us an idea of the size and, and, and you know, um, what is going to go into building these massive ships. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the Titanic itself comes in at 882 feet. This will make the Titanic the largest floating vessel in the world up until that time. Clearly today we have cruise ships that completely surpass the Titanic. But when it makes its maiden voyage in 1912 at 882 feet, this is the largest and longest ship ever afloat. So it's a big deal. Um, not only is it just 882 feet, but when we talk about the tonnage of this ship, this ship comes in at 46 thousand tons ridiculous how the hell does something like that even float and it's 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 an it's it's ingenuity that is beyond description because this ship is built by hand we don't have modern technology in um the early 1900s in fact the ship is actually started and laid down if you will the 31st of march 1909 every single piece of this ship is built by hand by irish hands uh, the, the, the iron, the, the funnels that will grace the top of the ship, the, the interior decorations to the carp, everything is handmade at this point. So it is a feat of engineering to literally be in history. Um, officially, the Titanic is ordered September 17th, 1908, building out of Harland and Wolf, which yeah, you have a great picture of there showing a bustling after work scene. This is time to go get your Schmidix and your Guinness in Ireland. Uh, when you see these guys actually moving in the streets there, these are a lot of these ship workers, the men that work in the Harland and Wolf shipyard in Belfast, who have now been dismissed from their day jobs to go and have their beer, go home to their families, or, or it's dinner time. So they're leaving the shipyard there. And you'll even, uh, one of the interesting things in that picture is you'll see one of the ships there and um, beginning to really show advertisements on commercial uh, vehicles there. So you have one of the trolleys moving and taking some of those shipbuilders to either their homes or to go get a beer. It was very common to see a lot of the shipbuilders going to get drinks afterwards. Uh, it's a hard work. You know, men die building this ship. Uh, I believe it's eight in total that actually will fall to their death or be crushed by the weight of some of the iron riveting that they're doing. So it's not just a a small feat by any means. Um, and that's why I bring up here because it's very integral to the story too, because these guys need to have a, a cool off or a, a exercise when you're building the Titanic, which is this large of a project. Yeah. And again, so um, give us a bit more detail about the, the, the men that built her and, and their lifestyle and, you know, how many guys was it going to take to build these two massive ships? And again, you know, um, many accidents, as you probably are, you know, like you've already said. Yeah, no, there was a lot of accidents starting that. And I, I think a lot of that not only comes from just, you know, the, the size of the shipyard, but there's some things that have to happen in order for the Titanic to even be put in. Um, before Harlan and Wolf really has all of these dry docks, if you will, the Belfast can't handle a shipbuilding like this. So there's an engineering feat that starts out even before... We're going to call Titanic 401 for its development phase, if that's okay. So if you hear me say 401, I'm just referring to the ship in development. Um, to build Harland and Wolf, this shipyard that will eventually create 401. The thing about it is you don't have the means to do that. So you have to create a shipyard. And 
in Belfast, there isn't that availability. So in order to do that, they have to actually irrigate and, and dig holes and create docks, dry docks, slippages, you name it, to uh, incorporate this Olympic-sized operation. No pun intended there. The Titanic is, uh, again, the largest ship being built at this time. So how do we build that? What type of support do we need to build that? Well, one of the things is, uh, I think I can see it in this picture here you have there off to the right. There is this huge steel structure that's built. And that's actually a temporary feature that is built specifically for 400 and 401 Olympic and Titanic. Because in order to, to bring the ship up off of the ground, you need to have an availability to get up really high and, and work on some of the sides of the ship. So um, thousands of men are going to be brought in to do this. And that, that itself, the men that are brought on in Ireland are parts of different classes. There's even riots that take place, refusals to work, um, unions that are going to be formed because of this and, and fights and threatened or threats to shoot each other. It's chaotic. It's not just a happy, let's go to work and build the grand old Titanic. And no, it, it was, it was chaotic. It, it was a, a work that really towers over Belfast. And that picture that you had on the last slide, if you look in the background, you can actually see the Titanic towering over Belfast. So its presence was felt and the city knew what it was building. Again, it took most of the folks living in Belfast that were uh, employees of Harland and Wolf and many other employees contracted out to make Titanic happen. So thousands and thousands of men are employed on this. Deaths happen um, because of the size of the ship, whether they fell from some of these temporary steel structures that were built to encase the ship as it was being built, or whether they were just crushed under some of the weight of the steel and iron used to build the ship. Um, it was not a safe building. Again, we mentioned that it was built by hand. Um, and to build this by hand, that took a lot of effort from these men. So the 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 sweat, the blood, and, and the sheer grit to build this ship was astronomical mm -hmm. and uh, what was thomas andrew's involvement in the uh you know in this 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 period was he um you know on site or was he uh he was you know? um he would start out in what they call the drawing room there was this really large room with workers around the clock drawing up floor designs, uh, drawing up blueprints, trying to get dimensions of the ship. And he's overseeing that from the very start. As the chief naval architect of Harland and Wolf, he has to see this thing on paper first before he can see this thing in real life, before the ship can even become a, 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 a built structure. He has to go and make sure that all the designs are set he knows beforehand what it's going to look like, kind of the, the, the brainchild behind all of this, even though he's not in charge of the building. He's the architect. So his, his, uh, his whole role in starting this ship starts in a drawing room. It starts with blueprints. It starts with these very large scale papers, which were um, not even paper, actually. They were drawn on linen. And to this day, if you go to Belfast, um, I don't know that you can walk in and see them yourself, but they are still in existence. The original blueprints that gave birth to the titanic are still in preservation which is awesome that we still have that because we know the ship isn't so that's yeah. it's great cool okay um so the the, the ship is built and uh, it's going to go on its maiden voyage so just give us a little bit of uh, history on its maiden voyage and, absolutely uh, when that happens before obviously it gets to southampton it goes on a couple of maiden voyages doesn't it it does. Um, it's going to have a couple trial runs. Thomas Andrews himself will be on these. So just make sure that the, the size of the ship can handle a voyage because that's, some, that's sort of the thing in you know the back of these guys' minds. Now, the Olympic made its maiden voyage quite a few months even before the Titanic even makes its trial runs. And when the Olympic goes out, there's a, a very large accident that takes place with the Hawk, which is a smaller ship that'll actually ram right into the ship and cause the Olympic to have to come back into a docking scenario where it's going to be repaired. So this leads the, the White Star Line to really want to test the RMS Titanic to make sure that she's seaworthy. Uh, she has these large boilers. These boilers are in, imperative to the operations of the Titanic because it's going to be run on steam. It's on coal. 
Um, many folks actually have the, um, you know, the understanding what RMS stands for. We should probably mention that the RMS stands for Royal Mail Steamer or Royal Mail Ship, either kind of depending on how you want to really interpret what RMS means. And that doesn't have to do with the, the boilers, which is kind of odd. It actually has to do a lot with the fact that it was contracted to carry mail. Um, but, you know, I did mention there the boilers were, you know, very integral because that was where you're getting a lot of your power for these engines. It was a triple screw ship meaning that it had three propellers. And if you just get an idea, these propellers, there's some very famous photography taken at the time of the ship being built, but you have huge propellers looming over people. Um, a person isn't even close to comparing to the size of one of her blades on those uh, propellers. So, you know, the Titanic in that regard has its um, kind of its own place in the world with being one of the first to have that there. Uh, to be exact with it, the um, pressure was given from the boilers into what we call the Parsons turbine, which is what drove the propellers to move. Um, if we're gonna look at um, horsepower, uh, all three engines gave it 30,000 horsepower, which again, ridiculous to think about there. Um, the Titanic moves, again, the reciprocating engines are what give it the horsepower. These reciprocating engines were 63 feet long, weighed 720 tons, and their bed plates contributed to another 195. So these are massive engines that are allowing the Titanic to have its propellers move. The boilers, we talked about those, 29 of which were in the ship. They were 15 feet tall and 20 feet long. Do you think that this was an easy effort? Absolutely not. You had to have an entire team almost on one boiler. So you can imagine how many people it took to allow these boilers to move. Do you know what the boilers were run off of? Do you know what the fuel was for these? Uh, was it coal? It's exactly what it was. It was coal. So there was this shoot off in front of the boilers where men were constantly taking shovels and throwing coal into the boilers to keep them heated. Uh, think of a modern day furnace, almost how a furnace runs with a pilot light and you know, what have you, but uh, that, that they didn't have that at the time. So this was still man powered round the clock. These boilers were manned by a team of firemen. Now, when we say firemen today, we think of somebody getting on a big red truck and pouring out a fire with a huge fire hose. No, no, no. These firemen, were involved with keeping a fire going, stoking the fire, making sure that it gave the power to the ship so that it could continue to move on its Atlantic. Uh, we're talking about a maiden voyage here. Another thing that we need to talk about because this ship is so important is, is the technology on the ship when it went on its maiden voyage or its, its trial run. The funnels, if you look at the picture you have here, I love that this one's on because you're actually seeing some of the steam coming out of the ship. But notice that back funnel towards the stern, that fourth funnel, that was false. That wasn't actually, excuse me, an operating funnel. It was there for a show. The three funnels you see in that picture are real and giving you the steam coming from those boiler rooms. But that fourth one in the very back of the ship was just to even it out, if you will, to make it look kind of, um, I, I guess, even. So that's actually not a real operating funnel. That, that's a decoy. It's there to make it look like it's symmetrical. Wow, I didn't know that. Cool. Yeah. With this maiden voyage brought on something else. You have ventilation and heating. With those boilers, you're also adding heat to the ship. It's comfortable. You have uh, uh, different classes. And when I say that, you have the first class. You're, you're very wealthy and rich people living on the ship in these absolute luxurious accommodations. Uh, you have wood paneling walls and... And you're eating almost nine course dinners when you're sitting down for dinner every single night. And then you have your second class passengers, which would be a middle class citizen almost. You know, you're not, not rich by any means, but you got a little bit of money to sail on this wonderful, large, luxurious ship. And then you have your third class passengers. Um, some would refer to them as steerage. Tucked away in not the greatest looking accommodations in the world. But hell, you're on the RMS Titanic, so it can't be that bad. These are basically immigrants. These are folks that are wanting to pick up their old lives in Europe and start a new life in the United States coming in by port of New York. And last but not least, we have one more really important part before we go on to the full maiden voyage. 
radio communications. The Titanic had a radio telegraph, wireless telegraphy. This is brand new to the shipping industry. Um, two employees, Jack Phillips and Harold Bride, are going to be around the clock operators of this, sending out different types of Morse code. Um, Guglio Marconi is the one that really gives this idea to fruition, and the Titanic is going to be able to feature this one of the, again, the first. And there are other ships out there that have this, but the Titanic's radio telegraph room is incredible for its time. It is very advanced. Again, there are people working around the clock, 24 hours, sending and receiving telegrams from either passengers, but also getting reports of weather. You know, the Titanic's maiden voyage is in April of 1912. In April 1912, one thing that's happening on the Atlantic is icebergs start floating out into the waterways and disrupting Atlantic passages. So when the icebergs are making their presence known, you need some type of warning system. You can't today, like we could probably pick up on radar or pick up a cell phone and text somebody that, hey, there's a big giant iceberg in front of you. Might want to avoid that. The way they did that was actually a texting system, but it was known as Morse code. You're, you're, you're tapping telegraphs, but you're able to do that wirelessly because you got to think too. You don't have this long giant wire running from ship to ship when ships are just miles and miles apart. You have to figure out a way to do that. And Marconi was able to implement the system to where you can send wireless messages. So that's another really important feature of the Titanic when it embarks on its maiden voyage. Wow. Fascinating. Absolutely. Okay, so eventually it does get to Southampton and that's where it's going to, um, you know, go on its journey. So just tell us sure. a little bit about and give us a bit more detail about its actual route. Absolutely. So again, it being registered out of Liverpool, it's not going to go out of Liverpool at all. It's going to go out of, like you just said, Southampton. Before it goes to Southampton, though, it stops at a place known as Queenstown, Ireland. Uh, when it starts in Queenstown, it's going to pick up a few passengers and then it's going to make its way to Southampton. Um, and Southampton is on the coast of the English Channel and it makes what we call a port of call. Um, it's going to stop from Southampton after picking out more passengers and trying to let a few off. So many folks that got on the ship also disembarked at Southampton. Um, one of those actually took some of these very famous photographs that you're showing today, guided by the name of Francis Brown, who was a Catholic priest, who even tried to um, encourage his um, Catholic higher ups, I guess. I don't, I don't know the exact terminology of who would be in charge of him. They told him to get your butt off of that ship now and come back home. You are not allowed to be gone this long. He wanted to stay on. Um, but folks like him and some other folks would actually disembark from the ship in places like Southampton and Queenstown. Um, once they picked up their final their passengers in Southampton, they moved to their final stop before going to their Atlantic voyage. And that is on the northern coast of France at a place known as Cherbourg. That's going to be the last place it picks up passengers. Um, but again, it's only making these port of calls to really grab more passengers who have secured their ticket on the RMS Titanic. And again, its final destination is New York City, as we know. Um, OK, let's talk about the captain. Uh, so, Edward, uh, J. Edward Smith. Smith. Tell us a little bit about Edward Smith and how he ends up becoming the captain of the Titanic. Absolutely. So Ed Smith is a White Star Line familiar face. He's been on many of the ships before the Titanic. In fact, he's on the Olympic and is um, set to retire. And his last voyage is going to be the captain of the RMS Titanic. He wants to take the RMS Titanic on its maiden voyage and bring it to New York safely. Uh, Smith is somebody, I, again, I don't want to speculate, but he's somebody that's very easy to succumb to, to pressure. Um, Ismay will actually be sort of a pressure to Smith you know, when he's on the Olympic, he's not having all these executives, if you will, on the Olympic. He's really got Ismay. Not only does he have Ismay, but he has Thomas Andrews. These two are succumbing to pressure. They have some very wealthy and powerful people on the ship in first class. So they're trying to make a very serious impression on the Titanic and, and, and just the people around the world. They want Titanic to make headlines. So Smith, rather than being, in my mind, a very responsible captain, kind of shows a bit of um, neglect here for the safety of the ship by allowing himself to listen to Ismay and, and Thomas Andrews and push the Titanic to its limits. Um, and what I mean by that 
is the speed in which the Titanic's going to try to arrive in New York. They want this ship to be there as fast as possible, even a day early to just make these massive headlines. And look how fast we got this luxurious liner here. And I remember from the start of this episode, I mentioned that it wasn't a ship built in the idea that it was going to be the fastest ocean liner, but a combined effort of Jay Bruce Ismay and Thomas Andrews being in Ed Smith's ear, give him the notion to push it to its limit so uh smith as as honorable of a captain as he is the amount of years he's had on his literal last voyage succumbs to that pressure and i think that definitely plays a part into the fate of what happens later on in their maiden voyage Mm -hmm. okay let's talk a little bit about the crew um i'll just tell you about these two pictures so one of them is absolutely the survivors I don't know which one, but one of them, I think, is beforehand. Um, But just tell us about the crew. So, you know, how do they get a job on the the Titanic? And are they already in the business of that sort of thing? And, you know, what sort of roles do they play? And, you know, all that sort of stuff. Sure. So um, Titanic had roughly 880 crew members on board for the maiden voyage. Um, None of them were permanent. None of them were um, told, hey, you're going to be on the Titanic for the rest of your career. This is now your ship. Um, these crews were some of them casual workers, even people that just came out of Southampton or uh, Belfast or wherever they picked them up from. So uh, the crew is a very diverse group of individuals. Um, a lot of these guys um, were recruits even. So this may be their maiden voyage. So double kind of whammy there for those gentlemen that are, are part of the crew. Um March 23rd in Belfast, of uh, uh, 1912 is when the recruitment really starts. So a lot of these guys are Irish. A lot of these guys are English, um, have been at sea before. Again, some of these are new recruits. Um, a few of these members, I'm going to name some very famous ones that we may know very well. A couple of them even featured in the movie in 97. Uh, William Murdoch, William McMaster Murdoch and Charles Lightoller come on. But they're actually bumped down in the ranks. Um he was a, a chief for mate and first officer. That's uh, so William Murdoch, chief mate, light taller is going to be first officer. Um, they were bumped down. The second officer is David Blair, who was also dropped altogether. And the third officer ends up being Herbert Pittman. He is the only deck officer who is not a member of the Royal Naval Reserve. So in order to be um, kind of an officer on the ship or in a very leading role in the crew, you would be in the Royal Naval Reserve. Um, Pittman survives the ship as well. And the Titanic uh, had divisions in the crew, uh, three principal departments. You had a deck crew made up of about 65 to 66 members, an engine crew actually coming in at 325, and the victualing, which came in at 494. The vast of these crew uh, were not seamen, but we mentioned earlier, engineers, firemen and stokers who were all responsible for being below deck the entire time, manning the boilers, the engine room, and what have you. 97% were male and 23 of the crew were female. Um, They would be the stewardesses. They would be the ones checking on your rooms, making sure you had good accommodations, um, your foods, and you have also bakers, chefs, butchers, and dishwashers. People, you had even had a gymnasium instructor. The Titanic had a gym people that did your laundry. You had folks that came in and made your bed every day. You had people that operated the mail and you even had a small newspaper on the ship known as the Atlantic Daily Bulletin who would take the wireless system and get news reported to it and be able to receive wireless news and and distribute news throughout the ship. Um, Most again, we uh, have an official signature on April 6th, 1912 in Southampton and 699 of those crew members came from Southampton. 40% 40% of those being needed for Southampton. Wow. Okay. Obviously, one of the most important parts as well is those passengers. So tell us what walks of life are these guys coming from? And I know you have sort of, you know, explained a little bit about that as well, about the different classes and everything. But, you know, what is the reason for some of these people traveling on the Titanic? What walks of life are they from? Absolutely. So the Titanic passengers were upwards at 1,300 people. About 300 plus of those will make up a first class. Your first class are your very wealthy individuals. Um, I'll give you guys one of the most famous, John Jacob Astor. John Jacob Astor, 
was one of the wealthiest people aboard the Titanic, um, a rich holder. You have folks like uh, uh, Isidore Strauss. Isidore Strauss is an interesting story as well, being uh, tied to the Confederate Army of the Civil War. So you have some folks that were involved in the United States Civil War that are actually going to be on this wow. ship. Yeah, very interesting thing. Um, Strauss himself is a, a shareholder in Macy's. In fact, one of the second owners, if not the owner of Macy's department store in the United States, a very wealthy individual. So this is really kind of the, the class that you're seeing when we talk about first class. Uh, then you have the second class. The second class, I don't want to say your average citizen, um, but maybe not wealthy, not an immigrant, not poor, but enough money to afford some decent accommodations on the ship. Um, a lot of those in second class makes up about just over 700. And then third class makes up the majority of what's on the Titanic. These are your immigrants coming from Europe. They're looking to start a new life in the United States. They want to leave Europe, pack up their belongings. It may be a father, a mother, and their kids. It may just be a single man, it might be a single woman with her friends. Um, but they're, they're looking to bring themselves into the United States to start an entire new life, come to the new world, if you will. Um, so the ship is as divided in that sense. Uh, your first class passengers have this, this absolute grand area of the Titanic to themselves. They're, they're able to have these nine course meals. They're able to have these luxurious smoking rooms and ballrooms and and really just live in style and, and these wonderful staterooms that could even give you a private promenade deck. So up there in the Titanic, you're seeing those huge open bay windows. That was sometimes privatized. If you were wealthy enough, you had your own deck to go out on. Whereas second and third class, you were sharing communal spaces when you're going out on the ship, on the deck, uh, things of that nature. Okay. And uh, okay then, so... Let's talk about a cost of a ticket then. So what would a cost of a ticket set you back uh, in the different classes and things like that? Um, so, yeah, that's it's another really important part of it. So what could set you back when it comes to a ticket um, is, is the cost alone. Um, I, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me here, but to get a first class ticket, again, you had to be of significant wealth. Your name had to be known pretty much worldwide. Um, second class, again, it's, it's somewhat affordable, but it also isn't the most affordable. You're still a little better off than most in this world. And third class ticket was made affordable, knowing ahead of time that you weren't going to have these grand, beautiful staterooms. You're going to be bunking with some strangers. You're going to be eating maybe a little bit less food than the rest of them. Um, again, we talked about communal spaces. These, these are, are, are spaces being shared by many people. So economically, there's a huge difference on your ticket and your experience on the ship and where you're staying on the ship. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. And uh, sure. okay. So um, off it goes into the Atlantic and uh, goes on its uh, and everything's going smoothly. And as we know, things are going to turn very bad. And yeah. uh, so tell us about the events leading up to hitting the iceberg and eventually hitting the iceberg itself. Absolutely. So on. Um, Obviously, the Titanic had an arrival in New York on Pier 59. After leaving Queenstown, uh, it had traveled close to about 55 nautical miles and then had 1,620 and continuing along what they called the Great Circle Route, a uh, very commonly used route by a lot of these ocean liners at the time. And this is moving through the North Atlantic Ocean. So we're not going south. We're, we're heading north around where all the icebergs typically show up this time of year in April. Um, on April 11th, around noon, the Titanic had covered close to 500 nautical miles. The following day on April 12th, 519. So, so we're seeing that pressure that I mentioned earlier from Ismay and Andrews on Edward Smith to push the Titanic to its limits. And it's covering ground extremely fast. So it's moving at 21 knots, 24 miles per hour, which is significant for a ship at that time, um, leaving it little room to maneuver in the event of a looming iceberg at night. It, it has many warnings to its wireless system that, hey, there are some obstructions here. The Titanic continues to move knowing the danger in front of it. On the 14th, there's something very significant that happened. Two things, a lot of things significantly happened on the 14th. One of these is a coal fire that has been burning since most of the voyage. And you would never know this. 
ship was on fire, if you will. Um, and it actually extinguishes on the 14th. The men are finally able to get it under control. Um, but it, it, it still has an effect later on. Um, it, again, it's receiving all these warnings, um, but Smith ignores them. And it, it's telling them that, you know, hey, we've seen these, these obstructions. These are going to cause problems if you don't move and change course. But they're on track to get there early. They're on track to get their headlines. Why would you want to continue to, to, to maneuver the ship around a bunch and slow it down for an iceberg that the unsinkable Titanic will not be phased by? Mm -hmm. And of course, there's that very famous scene in the movie, which I find one of the most powerful scenes is when the guy's sitting up in the lookout post and he mm -hmm. sees that iceberg. You know, It's a chilling such scene. Such a powerful part of that film. It is. And um, that takes place at about 1140 p.m. on April 14th. The guy by the name that you were just mentioning is Frederick Fleet. They're on the ice. They're on the uh, crow's nest of the ship. And off in the distance, they see this large mass starting to come into view. Unfortunately, this iceberg is literally dead in front of the Titanic's path. Frederick Fleet will immediately alert the bridge. Um, First Officer Murdoch is going to to be alerted to this and he orders a hard to starboard meaning the ship's going to move to its side to try to avoid it now this can open up a whole slew of speculation uh if the titanic hit it head on would it have survived if it, if it would have stayed on the course it could have made it through just burst the iceberg it's history we would speculation is dangerous it's not good to speculate so so sticking to the facts even though it was ordered to move it was moving so fast at a high rate of speed it wasn't able to completely avoid the iceberg. And icebergs are, are, are tricky to the eye. If you know anything about them, they may look small at the top. They may not be these large objects on the top, but below is where the problem is. These icebergs are not seen from beneath the surface of the water. And icebergs tend to be a lot bigger underneath than they are on the top. And that's really what plays into the Titanic striking the iceberg. So it will hit the iceberg at 11, a little after 1140, that's about the time they spot the iceberg for the first time. Um, it struck the iceberg, creating a series of holes, punching them, not, not a whole big scratch. It, the, the iceberg is, again, just, we don't know the size of it. We don't know exactly how it was, but um, from what we know, it was dented. And uh, it was just huge buckling that takes place of the uh, hull of the ship, and the seams completely split, and water just starts to pour into the ship. Now the ship has some watertight compartments, which is where it's, it's deemed unsinkable. However, five of those were breached. It can stay afloat with four breached, not five. Five of them being breached dooms the Titanic to begin sinking to the bottom of the North Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. So what is, so obviously, this is obviously going to be felt by everybody on board. So what is their emergency response to this? The fact that they've actually hit something, what is their immediate response? What is the captain's immediate response to, you know, this very serious situation that has just unfolded? Sure. Um, and it's only very serious to Smith and some of the folks that are in the bridge at the time. Uh, with this huge belief that the Titanic's unsinkable, many passengers just are like, oh, but, oh, it must have, uh, the engines must have stalled. There, I mean, there's, there's this belief with a lot of the passengers that they ain't nothing. It's okay. We're, we're going to be, all, we're going to be all good. Smith knows different. Jolted awake by the impact of the iceberg, he is going to start seeking answers. What just happened? What is the damage? What needs to be done? So Andrews himself will actually go to survey with a few of the crew members and see that <laughs> it's flooding. Five compartments are flooded. The watertight doors are set down to try and stymie some of this water from moving to the end in the steer of the ship, but it's a little too late. So this gives the engineers and, and Andrews and Smith the, the full realization that she is going to sink and she doesn't have long. That's the sad part about this. The timing about the sinking is absolutely crucial to saving the souls on board the ship. And I, I don't know how I missed this, but one thing I need to mention to you is the lifeboats. The, the, the ship is going to sink. That realization has now been brought on 
by the crew, by the captain, and by its chief architect, Thomas Andrews. With the ship being doomed to the bottom of the Atlantic, the Titanic has a big, big problem, the lifeboats. The designers of the ship went for luxury, right? So why crowd the ship with a bunch of lifeboats when the ship ain't going to the bottom of the ocean? Fast forward to April 14th, 1912, the ship's going to the bottom of the ocean and you don't have enough lifeboats for everybody on board. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. And you're faced with the problem of the timing. They're given an estimate on how long the ship has. It's not long. It's an hour and a half, maybe two and a half hours at, at the most. And that that's wishful thinking. Yeah. So um, they also make Mayday calls as well, don't they? And uh, they do. Course, so the evacuation of the of the boat itself um, in the movie, it's obviously very chaotic. And I can imagine very chaotic at the time as well. So so what and that must have been horrendous. And also you, you see in the lifeboats are going out half empty as well. Um, so just talk us a little bit about that chaotic, chaotic scene that would have been going on. Yeah. And that's, um, you know, there, there's kind of a something to, to do with that room, that, that, that radio room there, they are sending these codes out, um, and they were getting the warnings beforehand. Um, and there was even a attempt by the California to tell the ship that, Hey, there are these, these icebergs out here and they were trying to communicate. And there's literally a, a message sent to the, uh, the California shut up. Can you like the, the Titanic is telling that shit before it strikes the iceberg to shut up. The operator is like, well, to hell with this guy. I don't care. He just turns off his radio for the night. No, so the closest no. ship to it. Yeah. The closest ship to the Titanic is now basically saying F you to the Titanic and went to sleep. That, that radio is not operated. So even though the Titanic is sending out distress signals to ships that are all across the North Atlantic, the one that could be vital to its survival and getting these people off the ship into safety has been told by the Titanic to shut up. So in a way, the, the radio operators, Harold Bride and his, his, uh, his counterpart, they, they, they kind of doomed themselves with that. Um, but, you know, despite all of these signals going out, they see the California to make this even like to add insult to injury, if you will, they, they're able to see the lights of the ship in the distance. So um, with the, the radio operators not being able to really get anybody in time, the next effort is to start sending rockets out. Do you know what the California thinks? The Titanic's having a party. Because nobody in their right mind thinks this ship is going down. Mm -hmm. It's the unsinkable Titanic. It's the largest ship afloat. It's a palace. Um, I'm not going to entertain that God himself could not sink the ship because that's Hollywood. That's not said. that That's, that's bullcrap when it comes to the story. But, but it isn't when it comes to the fact that people don't think this ship's going to the bottom of the ocean. So when you see distress flares being fired from the ship, the California takes it as a party. So telling that ship to shut up and then sending those flares do nothing for the California to identify the Titanic as a sinking vessel in need of rescuing. Mm -hmm. and, and again, the, 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 the underfilling of the lifeboats, what's that all about? So that's to appease the first class passengers. They don't want to overload the boats. They don't want to send these boats to the Atlantic and scare the passengers that are in it. They don't want to upset people. Um, women and children first, that's the big call to put into the lifeboats. Um, you have not only the lifeboats that are on the main side of the ship, but you have collapsibles too. So it, it's a, uh, it's about just trying to rush and send these ships or lifeboats off the side um, maybe some of these men didn't have the proper training. There weren't a lot of drills done to launch lifeboats. It's a painstaking process to get them launched. And we, we talked about how the men that came on the crew were virtually just recruited in April 6th. That's just days before the ship goes out to ocean. So you don't have the proper training by some of the crew to put these lifeboats into the water safely. There's an incident when the lifeboats are being sent down the side of the ship where one almost crushes another and it takes the passengers in the lifeboat to actually get up and start cutting ropes so the sh lifeboat does not crush the passengers in the one beneath and this is where stuff's starting to get chaotic the titanic starts listing very heavily into the water because all of this watertight bulkheads are just being completely flooded so the the, the boats that are being half filled are uh, again numerous reasons whether it's we don't want to upset these wealthy, powerful people. We don't want to flip the boats. 
we just want to get them out of here. Um, that's eventually going to cause quite a bit of problems. Um, by the time the Titanic is sinking and it's this far out in the water, we mentioned when it left port that it had about 1,300. Um, the ship could have carried a full amount of lifeboats if it wasn't for the fact that they didn't want to, to overcrowd the deck because they could have put 3,340 men and women in these boats. That's not what happens. Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, as we know, the ship goes down, and uh, this is a great picture of, of that scenario. Yes. And, uh, you know, again, if you've seen the movie, I, I, I think it actually captures the uh, it very well, and uh, some of it's actually quite distressing to watch. Um, yes. The uh, people falling off and, you know, jumping and... You know, it's awful. But um, yeah, talk us about the actual sinking part of it and what the, what actually happens. Sure. So um, when the Titanic starts to list, like we just talked about, how it's really starting to move down into the water, it doesn't take long. The iceberg strikes at about 1150, 12 o'clock in the morning. We're starting to see the listing. And we're going to fast forward to about 2 o'clock in the morning. That's when things really start to pick up. At about 2.10, the ship is listing very high up. And because of the weight distribution now being completely thrown off and the water literally just waterlogging the bottom of the ship, something just horrific happens. The ship rises. The deck starts slipping. The boat deck completely dipped underwater. As the sea's moving into the ship, it snaps. And when it snaps... The water completely rushes in the ship. The propellers are now exposed way in the air. Survivors that were on that front side of the ship are sucked down with the suction of the ship pulling. It's actually going to split so much so that it completely separates from the stern. The bow just plummets and what we call it bullets down to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, two miles beneath the surface of the top of that water, it's going to just plummet, taking everybody that was on that part with it. The stern, however is a very deceiving thing. When it splits, that front bow just goes all the way down to the bottom. The stern starts to sort of bobble a little bit. And then in the movie, you see it stand up and hover for a minute. And then we're not, we don't see that happen. The ship is listing almost to a 90 degree angle and it bobs like a bobber. If you're going fishing, it's floating. It looks like maybe this part of the ship will stay afloat. Obviously, that's not going to happen. The water is going to push itself up into the realms of the Titanic, and the ship is going to start plummeting underneath. Again, I mentioned that suction. When that last piece of the ship, the stern is up there in the air, the propellers are clearly visible. People start to really, really panic at this point, and they're jumping off the top of the ship, and which is a, a very significant way down. Like This is a far jump that these men and women and children are enduring. Um, but it's a last ditch effort to try and survive this suction that's going to pull them with the weight of the ship down to the bottom. One thing that is absolutely integral to this story is the water. We're in April. The water is freezing. This is going to cause a hypothermic reaction in the human body. May not be instant, but there is a, a saying that it felt like knives hitting you everywhere. And I'm sure that's true. I had the experience of going down as a young kid to uh, the Ship of Dreams Museum in Orlando, Florida, where they had a replica iceberg there. And they told you to hold your hand to it for 15 seconds and put it to the back of your neck. And it was painful. It wasn't just, a, oh, wow, that's cold. Darren, this was painful. And to feel this throughout the entirety of your body, your body goes into shock. Not everybody had life vests on. People were drowning each other, trying to stay afloat, trying to grab any of this debris once the ship goes under. So on top of freezing to death, there's drowning. There's babies floating on this part of the ocean. This is a scene that nobody on earth was prepared to deal with. In fact, at this time, it's one of the largest maritime disasters ever seen in the world. Um, and the water itself being so cold ensured that if you didn't have anything to float on, if you didn't have a lifeboat, you were going to fall victim to the North Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. okay. 2 20 a.m., the ship is gone completely. Yeah, and that's it. And so, um, talk, talk about the, the the amount of loss of life that actually ends up, you know, people <sighs> losing their lives here. Yeah, it's, um, we lose 1,517. Wow. Yeah. Women, children, and men. 
and and talk a little bit about the survivors because what what you know i mean you're not going to be able to explain exactly what it was like but obviously people that are sitting in those lifeboats watching all of this unfold for them they must have kept this uh vision and this horrible scene in their head for the rest of their lives so what was it like for them afterwards so the 706 that made it out of this horrific experience are, are going to be rescued by a ship known as the Carpathia, coincidentally on path to New York. And as um, the, these passengers who survived, they left behind their entire lives. And I mentioned at the very beginning that these, uh, these men, that men, women, and children that come on as third-class passengers, they're immigrants. They've left everything in Europe to start new. And... Imagine just giving up everything you have to get on this huge ship and start a whole new life. And then everything you know that you had left goes to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. That's what they're feeling on the ship. They've watched fathers, mothers, sons and brothers and daughters just go down with that thing. So there, there are incomplete family units on these boats going to the Carpathia hearing the screams of their family members in that water once that ship goes under, watching the ship crush under the weight of the ships being up in the air. Um, these are absolute horrific things. And, you know, I'm not going to diagnose anybody with PTSD or anything, but you can only imagine the mental fatigue of having to get off this ship, being awoken from your sleep, sent to a random lifeboat. Maybe you were watching your parents hand you to a stranger. And now your parents are gone. Or as a parent, imagine your, your, your child being stuck on that ship. Mm. This, is, this is sometimes uncomprehensible. And I mean, I'm sorry if I'm getting emotional. This, this always gets me at this part of the story. Yeah, but yeah. It, it, to see everything, even the wealthy folks. You know, we tend in this world not to feel too bad about what happens to wealthy. But Isidore and Ida Strauss, a very elderly, wealthy couple, decide that they're going to go down with the ship together. John Jacob Astor doesn't make it. People mm -hmm. who who played a part in history. Yeah. So as as much of a ray of sunshine that we like to make out the Carpathia to be, it's not. It's another place of horror. The Carpathia arrives at 4 a.m. And the folks that are boarding this from the lifeboats aren't. Thank you for saving my life. Where's my family? Mm -hmm. What happened to my wife? What happened to my husband? What happened to my dad? What happened to my daughter? Where's my son? Only to find out they're not here. And they see the last of the lifeboats come to the Carpathia. That kind of gives them the definitives that your family didn't make. Wow. Yeah, that's really, uh, you know, a powerful and uh, so obviously it doesn't arrive in New York, as we know, because it goes down. And so what is the press's response to the sinking of the Titanic in both, you know, in the world, really? I mean, obviously, it's going to be publicized in London, England and uh, America as well. But of course, around the world's going to hear about this. So what is the response and what, you know, what are the headlines, you know? Um, I think the entire world is just shocked. You see in both England and the United States, these large amounts of people gathering around the White Star Line offices because they have an office in New York and they have an office in London. And, and these large groups are like, our extended family was coming here. What happened? Uh, there are mixed reports uh, upon the first news breaking. Um, someone even says, oh, it's fine. Titanic's good. Just hit an iceberg. Little hiccup. It's coming into port. Um, but a lot of the agencies are starting to break the realization and the reality of the fact that that, that whole ship is gone. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's quiet after a while. There's a lot of noise with the, the crowds surfacing at these areas, like the white star line offices in New York and in, in, in London, but the more and more the newspapers start to reach out and the three days in between the sinking and the Carpathia's arrival in New York, reality really does start to set in. And that leads to confusion. And then, anger and inquiry, if you will. Um, both the British courts and the United States Congress are going to launch extreme investigations into this, this incident. Um, 
it's not until later in the day on the 15th that the news really came in that the Titanic's lost and that most of her passengers and crew were gone. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk, um, let's move on from the actual uh, event now and talk about the wreck itself because it is probably mm -hmm. one of the most visited wrecks in the world. You, uh, you know, people and, and historians and, and all sorts have been going down to the Titanic for years, haven't they? So tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely. So from 1912 all the way to the 1980s, we haven't really known where the wreck was at. The wreck is uh, sort of been a mystery. We knew where the, the general area may have been, but when it comes to the specifics, the depth, the location, it remained a mystery. Uh, the Titanic was thought to have sunk in one piece. You know, some folks had the idea that the funnels were still attached to the ship. No one knew what exactly was going on. So a couple of things are about to happen for us to figure out where the ship's at. Um, a number of expeditions were launched to secure the location of the Titanic, but bore no fruit. And on September 1st, 1985, a Franco-American expedition that was led by Jean-Louis Michel and Robert Ballard found the ship. Now, recently, um, I mean, very, very recently, it was uncovered or released that the mission was not to find the Titanic. In fact, Robert Ballard was on a mission sort of spying on Soviet submarines, believe it or not, in the 80s. They were, they were really looking at Russian activity in the water. Crazy to think about. As a young kid, I was introduced to Dr. Robert Ballard when my parents took me to see him speak in a Northern Virginia high school about finding that. One of the greatest days in my life was meeting the man that found the ship that brought me into this world of history. Wow. And... Even then, he never told us that the, the, the discovery of the Titanic was a, a second. Hey, since you're out there, go ahead. Um, my whole life up until that, up until recently, I had under the impression that, that this was his big contribution to the world. But it still is. It's, it doesn't take away from the fact that he found the freaking Titanic, man, in 1985. Um, but it was discovered. The Titanic was very, very, very deep underneath the surface. It's 12,000 feet beneath the ocean, roughly two miles deep. Um, it took a lot of efforts to find it. And um, one of the most powerful things about finding that ship, I saw this in one of the National Geographic documentaries released subsequently after the ship was found. Uh, Martin Sheen, our Gettysburg guy, I told you there is no time for that. You know exactly who I'm talking about. Uh, he's actually narrating this documentary. And it, it's I saw it on VHS for the first time. And it was, he still had that audio tracking where it had to get the audio in sync with the movie, you know, all those. Yeah. Um, and I'm watching this. And one of the things that I remember more than anything was the duality of the mood on the ship that discovered the Titanic. When they first found a boiler, God damn, we found the ship. They're slapping each other, popping champagne bottles. And then it hits them. We're on top of one of the largest mass graves in the world. Yeah. And that, that somber mood hit. And that, that still to this day is so powerful in my brain. Because that's what it must have been like. You know, wow, we found it. This is the ship. But crap. We're where the ship went down. That scene I described to you earlier, that, that horrific thing that these people went through, you're sitting on top of that now. And so instantly they kind of shifted moods to that. So, so hey, we need to do an honor thing. And they, they later wreathed down and they said the rest of that night was, was no longer a champagne popping beer drinking night. It was, a, it was a night to pay respects to those folks that went down with the ship. So it was discovered. And then um, now missions were specifically sent out to gather more specifics on the wreck. And um, a lot of really interesting technology comes out of a place called Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, um, part of the North Atlantic coast there. They're going to send some um, submersibles that are specifically designed to handle that depth of the ocean. And Robert Ballard's able to take an expedition down to the bottom and see her face to face for the first time. And I love that you have that picture right there on the left. The, the one on the right, there is no photograph to this day that exists of the entirety of the wreck. And the reason for that is the depth alone and how dark it is. What you have on the left of this screen 
That's is a legitimate mean. photograph of the yeah. wreck. You're looking at the front of the RMS Titanic. Ken Marshall is the one who has painted the one over here on your right. Mm -hmm. um, one of the most legendary Titanic illustrators ever. And he was able to do so because of Robert Ballard's extensive missions to the bottom of the ocean to see the Titanic. This is also where they discover it split. At first, they only found the front of the ship. They didn't realize that this ship had split and that the, the stern of the ship was significantly farther away from the front so so what you're seeing there is piecing together of the wreck um there's some aerial views in one of his books called discovering the titanic that's a book that was published quite like literally after his uh, first expedition down to the bottom and they were able to really bring this picture to life but the, the most powerful one on this screen right here is not the artist rendition but the one on the left Mm -hmm. well so it looks think, like rusticles so i'm sorry go ahead sorry yeah and again how many expeditions have they actually had over those those years from oh man five all the way to now oh since then there have been numerous um some of those being a little offensive in my mind because some of those are very selfish some of those are to grab artifacts and put really? them in museums oh. yes um and some of these are very selfish gains to i have a piece of the titanic because i have mm -hmm. enough money to go down there and pull a piece off the ship itself is a threat right now. Um, yeah. It's deteriorating. What you're seeing in that left picture, what look like rusticles are bacteria. Those are living organisms eating the freaking ship. And, and we think, oh, it's just rust. It's barnacles. It's, it's No, that those are detrimental. Um, one of the things that you can clearly see in the illustration here on the right is how much of the ocean floor has consumed the Titanic. And it, it's, it's actually moving further down as we speak. You know, the... It's getting destroyed, and I hope it's not in my lifetime, but in the future that we're going to lose the entirety of the wreck. Mm -hmm. So that begs a lot of questions. You mentioned how many expeditions. There have been a lot because we need to understand now, is it possible to raise the ship? Are we able to grab and salvage as much of it as possible and bring it up and put it in restore, you know, restore it, but to, to save some of the artifacts? Should we even mm -hmm. do that? That's, That's the real ask. Is there a plan or was there ever a plan to bring it back up or because of, you know, the circumstances just to leave it where it is, you know? I mean, again, it's a huge thing. So, you know, bringing it up would not be an easy task, but we've got no. technology now. We that, do. You know, that's a difference, isn't it? That's the question, though. This is a mass grave. Um, there are no bodies left. Sadly, they are, um, and this is a little graphic, so I'm sorry, but they're crushed under the pressure there, so there's nothing. You don't have the picture of the shoes, do you? I don't know. Um, and folks, you can look at this on your own if you get a chance, but there's a very powerful picture that Ballard was able to get. So the bodies don't last long because of the pressure. It deteriorates, but some of them did make it to the ocean floor, but obviously they're gone now. But one of the things that remain is a pair of shoes. Wow. Yeah. That tells us, and, and you know, this is personal. Some people may not agree with me, but I think you leave that damn ship where it's at. Yeah, me too. That is the That's final resting place of thousands of souls, of women, children, and adults. You don't disturb it. Mm -hmm. I get some of the artifacts being brought up for the continuation of the story so that we don't lose the story, so that we can have some tangible artifacts to this ship we have a connection you're able to see it there's an exhibit in los angeles right now where a part of the hull is on display and even that i'm still sort of iffy about i'm like that's still somebody's resting place so i look at it and compare it to going to a cemetery and grabbing somebody's headstone or chipping a piece of somebody's headstone and taking it and putting it on display somewhere you wouldn't do that yeah. so why would we take the titanic and rip it apart piece by piece by piece that we've we've already taken so much from and why would we take that to a museum or Las Vegas for all sakes? Like, yeah. Why? So oh, okay. uh, personally, yeah, yeah. I'm with you, Darren. I don't think we should be touching. No. Okay, mate. So anyway, thanks for explaining the story of Titanic. But before we um, hop off the podcast, you want to give a plug to a few books that I do, have helped you recently in the research of this. So just give give us a little uh, insight into those books. Sure. Um. So obviously I could go on for 
eight hours <laughs> about this thing thing, especially when it comes to the construction. Um, so, but I don't have them in my hands right now because each book weighs close to 15 pounds and I'm not just plugging these things up. Um, but it's shit magnificent. It's not easy to acquire. It's a, it's a hundred dollar plus investment, two volumes on the building and then the fitting out of the ship. If you want to know everything, and if you're a very serious student on Titanic, that is where you go. Um, the more accessible route, start with this one. It's the Ship of Dreams. Um, this book is written by Gareth Russell, who is a native of Belfast, Ireland. Um, and it, it goes through some of the lives that are on the ship. It goes through the, the Edwardian era of the Titanic, which is the era the ship was built in. So it talks a little bit of backstory on the people that were there. Um, so I think the Ship of Dreams is the most accessible to the general public without getting too much in the weeds. Again, back to the serious student. The Bible of the ship is on a sea of glass. This book here. Uh, Tad Fitch, J. Kent Layton, and Bill Wormstead are going to be the authors of that. It's, a, it's an effort. It's a textbook. Um, the, the text is biblically small, so it's like little, little tiny words. But everything you want to know about that ship is in this book. And I, I can't stress enough. If you want to know everything about it, you don't have the hundreds to spend on the ship magnificent volumes. On a Sea of Glass is 30 pounds in England. It's not a book published in the United States, so you do have to find a published. Those help tremendously with this story today. Yeah, cool. And uh, just just quickly on the uh, you know the books. Um, so the survivors themselves was there was there much written by the survivors, and so was there that rich source of first hand accounts of you know what actually happened on that absolutely night. uh lawrence beasley writes one called the loss of the ss titanic even though it's rms uh you would think somebody on the ship would know better um but that that exists and there's also some accounts that i would refer to you guys um by charles lightaller who was an officer that survived this sinking and um has congressional testimony so if you look at some of the proceedings in the u.s congress you can hear that whether you like him or not, Bruce Ismay does get on a lifeboat and saves himself and um, is forced to testify in Congress as well. So his congressional testimony is a primary source. That is a, a, a direct source from someone on the ship. So I'd point you to Lightoller. I'd point you to Beasley. I'd point you to Ismay. Um, and so many others, some survivors have published accounts in newspaper articles. Um, there was one that I, I featured on my Unfiltered Historian page, a newspaper article about a lady that heard about a ship sinking off the coast of Norfolk, who lived in Norfolk, who was a Titanic survivor and made some, some comments in the newspaper about, wow, this brings back a lot of memories because I was on a ship that sunk to the bottom. You may have heard of it. It was the RMS Titanic. So yeah. there's, there's plenty of stuff. Google um, congressional proceedings are very long and exhaustive. I don't think they've been published into a volume yet. Maybe one day they will. Um, but there's a lot of like nitty gritty that probably doesn't need to be integral to the story that takes place in that. So um, get dive through those too. But um, Beasley's and especially Ismay's account and the congressional proceedings were, were wow. pretty, pretty good. All that's left to say is thank you very much, my friend, and uh, cheers. Yeah, Darren, thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to tell the story with you, and I hope that it, it was a good story for folks to hear.